Good morning and welcome to Deeply Rooted. I'm your host, Robin Norgren, and I am here to walk alongside you and you walk alongside me um, as we walk through the world trying to connect more deeply with the reality that we are spiritual beings having human experiences. And my desire for all of us is that we would love more deeply, realize how much more the same we are than different, that we really are one, and that our spirituality would cause us to live out our human experiences more fully. So glad you're here. Today's mantra, I am letting go of unnecessary burdens. I am letting go of unnecessary burdens. Here's a quote from Oprah Winfrey. I choose to rise up out of that storm and see that in moments in desperation, fear, and helplessness, Each of us can be a rainbow of hope, doing what we can to extend ourselves in kindness and grace to one another. And I know for sure that there is no them, there's only us. Here's some thoughts. Life moves in cycles, patterns. Each one of us is, if we are paying attention, can see these patterns that make up the essence of who we are. We are more attuned to seeing it in others. Yes, many times the weaknesses, the missteps, history repeating itself. But I'm talking today about good cycles. The cycles, patterns, tendencies, where I've done it right. I invite you to talk with someone dear to you today and ask her what she sees. Here's another activity in the series called The Art of Noticing, uh, inspired by the book from Rob Walker. And this exercise is, is called Look Really, Really Slowly. In her art history classes, Jennifer L. Roberts makes her students regard a single work for a painfully long time. How long exactly? Three hours. Her students, not surprisingly, resist the idea. It is commonly assumed that vision is immediate, Roberts has written. It seems direct, uncomplicated, and instantaneous, which is why it has arguably become the master sense for the delivery of information in the contemporary technological world. But what students learn in a visceral way in this assignment is that in any work of art, there are details and orders and relationships that take time to perceive. When their resistance dies down, Roberts reports, her students find that looking really, really slowly forces them to notice things they had initially passed over, sometimes changing their entire understanding of a work. The process unlocks meaning and potential that first glances can miss. This can be applied well beyond the context of contemplating works of art. Look really, really slowly at almost anything, and chances are you'll see more than you ever could have imagined.
Well, today I'd like to look at the eight myths around drawing. And this is inspired by a book called Drawing with Children, a creative method for adult beginners too by Mona Brooks. So here is myth number one. The ability to draw is inherited. This is one of the main reasons people believe they can't draw. If you don't have an artist in your immediate family, and many of us don't, you might have decided it was impossible for you to draw after a few minor attempts. Once you've bought the idea that drawing is an inherited talent, you are probably too quick to give up when you don't achieve immediate success, or your beginning attempts feel uncomfortable. Can you imagine how many people would learn to roller skate if they took the same approach? Drawing is a teachable subject, and artistic talent can be developed. When I first faced packed schoolrooms of 35 restless and doubting preteens, I wasn't quite sure I would have the success that the original preschoolers had had. I think I was as shocked as everyone else when time after time, all the children achieved a variety of imaginative and successful results. I now realize that such success can be expected when you create a safe environment and give students the information they need. As for hereditary artists, some of the most resistant students come from a family with a designated artist as one of its members. Many artists bring their children to um, to art classes with the hopes that someone outside of the family will encourage them to try. These children often have refused to draw at all for fear of being compared with the artist in their family. So this is something that I definitely have a lot of history around. As I mentioned in the past, in the last uh, few podcasts, I um, would create Um, I I shouldn't say create. Yeah, I guess I could call it that. I would create these circles of creative friends. So it's kind of like when you watch um, reality TV and somehow you live vicariously through them and you never actually have to do anything if you haven't done that. (laughs) Good for you. Um, But I, as I mentioned before, um, my, um, my sister could draw naturally my brother, um, my oldest son, my son's father, my daughter, and my current husband (laughs) of 20 years. Uh, And and my my best friend, she was an artist as well, or she is an artist. And so I would just like gather these people around and there was a part of me that wanted to learn so, so badly. Um, And you know, uh, let's let's just be really candid. Um, sometimes I find artists are not, they love that idea of like only certain people can be artistic and they almost make it so mysterious as to not try to teach you because I can tell you, I tried asking people around me that I loved and um, they were not very kind. They were not very receptive to my desire to uh, to learn. And so I really did almost have to go in the closet and learn these things because of course, you know, I'm an adult, you know, by the time I really wanted to try and it's so embarrassing to like ask people for help and then they like push it aside like it wasn't a big deal to ask, you know, come on, who wants to admit weakness? Um, but I can honestly say that it was, um, it, uh, it, for me, it showed how much I wanted to do it, right? Because I have along the way tried many things. I've tried to write poetry. I've tried to learn to play the ukulele. I've tried all of these things. And all of them fall by the wayside. But this one thing, drawing, art journaling, creativity, I've never in the last... 16 years stopped and so that in and of itself was very telling to me that it was something that I craved 
in the deepest places of my heart. And I can go on to say even further that um, it, it healed me. It was a tool for healing for me. And so even as I read these words um, from uh, Mona Brooks, I know looking at classrooms from preschool to eighth grade and how all of those all that baggage that can come in around this creative process. But if you create the place of safety, most children really thrive. Now, what some of you don't know is that I actually tried to take these ideas to adults first. Like I try to create art classes where I would open up you know, this opportunity <laughs> to be creative. And oh my gosh, I'll, I will tell, I will talk about this more in future podcasts. Let's just say it didn't go well. And I remember one particular class where I was running up against so much uh, emotional and mental opposition in that class that I really, I, I, it was like, this is the last time I'm going to teach adults. <laughs> And that's when I switched over to teaching kids. Now, I say that, but I think I've learned things along the way teaching preteens that I think now I look back on those art classes with adults and I go, oh, this is what I was up against. So I feel like I have become better equipped for how to create a class now and how to make that arena a safety uh, for adults. So stay tuned for that. But uh, anyway, if you uh, want to do the drawing exercise um, that I did in the prior podcast, just go back into my archives. And then this um, understanding the myths is based on that drawing exercise. So this is part two of a conversation um, by Henry Nowen in his book, Spiritual Direction. And in the first part of the series, uh, he was talking about how he was at the pinnacle in his career. Uh, from the outside looking in spiritually, he was at the top um, being a, um, a minister and a psychologist, and yet something was lacking. And he was invited to, t to come into community with um, a group of mentally disabled uh, people. And um, here is uh, part two of that essay. My life with Adam. The first thing asked of me when I arrived at La Arche was to help Adam with his morning routine. Of all names, Adam, it sounded like working with humanity itself. Adam, a 24-year-old, was not able to talk, nor was he able to walk. Adam was not able to dress or undress himself. Even though he followed me with his eyes, it was difficult to know for sure whether or not he actually knew me. He was limited by a body that was mishappened and he suffered from frequent epileptic, epileptic seizures. At first with Adam, I was afraid, and so working with him was not easy for me. I would rather have been teaching at the university because I knew how to do that. I had no experience of caring so intimately for another human being. Don't worry, the other assistants assured me. Soon you will really meet Adam and then you will know how to hold him and how to be with him. I went to his room at seven in the morning. I gently woke him and helped him get up. I held him up and very carefully walked with him to the bathroom because I was frightened that he might have a seizure. When I had undressed him, I struggled to help him into the bathtub as he was as heavy as I am. I started to pour water over him, wash him, shampoo his hair, and take him out again to brush his teeth, comb his hair, and return him to his bed. Then I dressed him and held him from behind as we walked together to the kitchen. When he was safely seated at the table, I offered him breakfast. 
he was able to lift the spoon in his mouth. Mainly because Adam loved to eat and enjoyed all his meals to the full, we ate together and I carefully watched him as he ate. It took a while and I was aware that I had never sat silently watch, watching with anyone, especially a person who took about an hour to eat breakfast. Then something transpired. After two weeks, I was a little less frightened. After three or four weeks, it dawned on me that I was thinking a lot about Adam and looking forward to being with him. I realized something was happening between us, something intimate and beautiful that was of God. I don't know how to explain it very well. God was speaking to me in a new way through this man. Little by little, I discovered affection in myself and came to believe that Adam and I belonged together. To put it simply, Adam silently spoke to me about God and God's friendship in a concrete way. First, he taught me that being is more important than doing. That God wants me to be with him and not do all sorts of things to prove I'm valuable. My life has been doing, doing, doing. I'm a driven person wanting to do thousands and thousands of things so I can show somehow finally that I'm worthwhile. People had said, Henry, you're okay. But now, here with Adam, I heard, I don't care what you do as long as you will be with me. It wasn't easy just to be with Adam. It isn't easy simply to be with a person and not do much. Adam taught me something else. The heart is more important than the mind. When you've come from an academic culture, that's hard to learn. Thinking with the mind, having arguments, discussing, writing, doing. That's what a human being is. Didn't Thomas Aquinas say that human beings are thinking animals? Giving high priority to an intellectual approach to life was deeply honed, was a deeply honed value in me. Well, I'm not certain how Adam thought, but gradually I became convinced that Adam had a heart, a real human heart. All at once I saw that what makes a human being human is the heart with which one can give and receive love. In giving himself so totally in my hands, Adam was giving me an enormous amount of God's love from a trusting heart, and I was giving Adam of my love. There was an intimacy that went far beyond words or acts. When the physical, emotional, and intellectual or moral life commands all the attention, we are in danger of forgetting the primacy of the heart. The heart is that divine gift that allows us to trust not just God, but also our parents, our family, ourselves, and our world. Very small children seem to have a deep intuitive knowledge of God, knowledge of the heart, that sadly is often obscured and suffocated by the many systems of thought we gradually acquire. People with physical and mental disabilities easily can let their hearts speak and thus reveal a mystical life unreachable by many intellectually astute people. This is because the mystical life, the life of the heart, originates in God at the very beginning of our existence. We belong to God from the moment of our conception. We are born in intimate communion with God who created us in love. And we die into the loving arms of God who loves us with an everlasting love. I'm ashamed to say that it took me some time to move from thinking that Adam, far from being primarily physically and mentally challenged and therefore not my equal, was in fact my brother. He was a full human being, so fully human that he was chosen by God to become the instrument of his love. Adam's vulnerability gave space for the heart. Adam, for me, became just heart. The heart in which God chose to dwell, 
in which she wanted to speak to those who came close to Adam's vulnerable heart. And I understand, too, that I have learned in Latin America what I learned in Latin America a few years earlier of God's preferential option for the poor. Indeed, God loves the poor, and God loved Adam very specially. He wanted to dwell in Adam's body so he can speak from that vulnerability into the world of strength and call people to become vulnerable and to offer their brokenness to God in ministry. Finally, Adam taught me something about community. Doing things together is more important than doing things alone. I came from a world concerned with doing things on one's own, and here with Adam, weak and vulnerable and dependent on others. I couldn't help Adam alone. We both needed all sorts of people. At La Arche Daybreak, we had people from Brazil, the United States, Canada and Holland, young and old, living together in one house around Adam and other handicapped people. As the weakest link among us, Adam created community. He brought us together, his needs and his vulnerability, made us into a true and loving community. With all our differences, we could not have survived as a community if Adam hadn't been there. His weaknesses became our strength and our rallying point. That's what I learned from Adam, God's beloved son. I lived at daybreak 10 years before Adam died. His story is my story of weakness, vulnerability, and dependency, but also of strength, authenticity, and giftedness. Can you dare to believe that God's story about you puts your story in spiritual perspective? One thing to do, one way to do this is to write down your personal story without editing out your vulnerability and brokenness. To be willing to tell your story to others. This is the discipline of witness in the world. <laughs>